so a very good morning to one and all present here uh, today is the fifth day of this uh, faculty development program organized by department of electrical engineering at nit kurukshetra on the topic uh, online faculty development uh, program on electrical distribution system analysis with renewable energy uh, sources so today uh, our expert is professor aswani kumar convener of this course uh, also head of the department so uh, he has already given one lecture uh, in this faculty development program so uh, I, i am not repeating the uh, that uh, introduction all of you already know uh, the sunil sir so uh, sir i would like to request you to start the session okay so dr gupta thank you very much uh, for coordination of this program and uh, Uh, you are uh, very nicely doing uh, throughout the previous days today is the final and uh, i hope that uh, we will end up with a uh, very good session today and uh, after that we have uh, uh, your uh, test for the candidates then uh, we will have a benediction program okay so this this is the program of the today so i will start with the today's lecture today this morning so a very good morning to one and all all the participants uh hopefully all of them will join on the way so i will start with the presentation Dr. Gupta, PPT is visible. No, uh, yes, sir. PPT is visible. Okay, so I will go to the slide show and uh, start from the beginning. Uh, full screen is visible. Yes, sir. Full screen is visible. And it is rolling as well. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So, a very good morning to all the participants. Uh, the today's lecture is on uh, overview of ancillary services especially in the context of the smart grid and uh, both covering the transmission and distribution network uh, a very important point here is the ancillary services second important point is the smart grid probably all of you have understood the concept of smart grid why we have gone for the smart grid what are the functions of the smart grid and what are the technical complexities of this smart grid and what are the various issues and aspects related to this smart grid area so most of the uh, aspects of this smart grid especially in the distribution sector side has already been covered by the eminent experts and uh, uh, probably if you remember i have discussed with you that uh, since we have already gone for the competitive structure of the uh, distribution as well as the trans uh, your generation system in a our system network so this competition was the main uh, responsible figure for the uh, birth of the smart grid and uh, especially we have the hybrid generation today with the integration of the conventional generation as well as the uh, your non conventional sources so because of the uh, integration of these sources there had been many many issues of the uh, power variation in network and this power variation has to be taken care by the important components in a system and uh, there was the introduction of the hex controllers there were introduction of uh, your power electronic interface which has caused uh, the grid to be operated in the manner as a human think so human thinking has to be involved in a grid so that the grid can operate successfully under any normal and abnormal conditions and whenever there is the Uh, any kind of uh, casualty in a system the smart grid must be capable of giving information and uh, taking suitable action from the operator side to make up a grid operating successfully so this is how the smart grid is uh, uh, with a with a brain inside will function but how the brain will function for the smart grid to operate successfully means it has to operate 
uh, under the faulty condition, taking decisions to take out the faulty part from the healthy part. It has to take uh, adaptive to the different kind of load variations. The grid has to be adaptive to the changes in the operating state of a system. Grid has to be adaptive whenever there is a change in the generation from the renewable system. And uh, there has to be uh, certain factors which need to be very much controlled as well as observed in real time so that the health of the grid is maintained uh, very nicely. So yesterday there was a wonderful lecture from industry person from uh, uh, PRDC. Okay, and I think uh, much of the details related to the different kind of the equipments which are connected in a system that has been given to you and how the electrical vehicles will have an impact on the system. So taking into account all these important aspects of a system, we need certain services in a network to operate the entire grid uh, successfully, reliably, stably, as well as the in a secure manner. So such services which are there uh, essentially required for the system operation, we call them as the ancillary services. So today's topic is about those services, uh, why there is a need, okay, and uh, why these uh, ancillary services have become more important today, and uh, who will provide the ancillary services, who will maintain the ancillary services, and how these ancillary services help to make the system operate, operating uh, uh, in a secure manner. So that will be the more important aspects to be covered today. So before we go for the uh, ancillary services, their definition and uh, their need, their characteristics, we must understand that what is the difference of the modern power system today and the system which was earlier. If you think of uh, 10 years back, the state of the modern power system and today's modern power system, there is a lot of change in the operating state and these operating changes you must understand. The first very important point is your wide geographical spread uh, because of the larger distances which are involved between the generation stations as well as the load centers. So the geographical spread uh, as well as the electrical distance between the components is very large. So looking into this uh, geographical spread as well as the electrical distances, uh, there is a concern for the power flow in a proper manner and we have to think of uh, the network stability in a wide perspective. Otherwise, it's not possible at all to operate the system successfully in a wide uh, area network, okay? So BAMS technology uh, is the way uh, with a PMU uh, spread over all over the component, all over the uh, regions, which is giving you the real time information because of this wide geographical spread of a system. So large number of the interconnections are there. We have HBDC back to back stations. We have HBDC lines. We have uh, extra high voltage AC lines. There's interconnection of all the regions. And uh, these all regions have to be operated in an economic manner. We have to be very careful about the environmental conditions because we cannot go for more and more execution of the lines. Environmental issues are there. So network reliability, stability, and security comes out to be a very important figure for uh, because of these interconnections. There's a rapid growth in the demand of electricity, 7 to 10% if you see globally, uh, a huge amount of the growth required because of the increase in the population pressure, because of uh, standard of living of the people, because of development of the industries, townships, uh, small or big industries. So there is a huge pressure uh, for the demand of electricity. So network is very, very uh, typical today because of the overloading situation in a network. So this has to be taken care for security of the system. Power system components uh, have to be operated judiciously, economically, because we cannot uh, execute the transmission system for all the generating companies. So we have to use this path economically. So there is a reason that we need to have an interconnection and these all interconnections have to be successfully uh, adequately taking care of the power and uh, investment cost for the infrastructure is around 35% of the total cost. So being a very uh, major component of the cost, we have to think of that the transmission and distribution path has to be operated economically and uh, near to their limits. There is a high penetration, as all of you know, that uh, renewable energy sources have become as a viable source of energy, where the cost is compared to, compared, comparable to the uh, conventional generation. Uh, if you remember yesterday's lecture, the server was saying that uh, the cost is around 2 rupees 30 pesos. So uh, because of the renewable system, since uh, they have become viable from the cost point of view, there is more and more penetration in the system, but 
more and more penetration have other important issues because of the intermittency of these sources. And relay coordination, another aspect for the protection of the system has emerged. Okay. So with these sources, the coordination of the relays switches uh, is very, very typical. So it has to be automated. It has to be automatically uh, operate, okay, taking appropriate decisions. Power quality is emerging another important aspect because of the nonlinear load as more and more uh, power electronic interfaces are there because of the renewable energy sources as well as but control of a system. So power quality uh, need to be taken care of in uh, a modern power system. So system stability, reliability has to be maintained. Okay. So competitive structure definitely needs monitoring control with a strict regulation to be followed. Otherwise, what will happen that uh, system will not operate reliably and successfully and uh, the power quality will deteriorate and we will not be able to maintain the adequate and secure supply system to the uh, consumers. So, uh, this, me, I have already, yeah. Some uh, package is appearing on the top of the uh, PPT. Okay, so let me check. If possible, uh, let me share. Let me check this why it is appearing. Uh, now it is okay. Now it it's is okay. okay. Now? Uh, again, it came. It came. It is okay now. Now? It, now, now it is okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gupta, you can uh, connect with Sukhdev. He was ringing me. Uh, yes, I will connect, sir. Okay. Yeah, you connect him and uh, say that uh, DAC is pending for all bills. So he can come here, CCN, and collect the DAC. He, and... he will meet you at 11.30. I will call, sir. Yeah, okay. So this, uh, we have already discussed that uh, we have a two uh, phase of the uh, competitive structure today. One is the uh, financial transaction phase. Another is the physical operation. And both financial and physical, they have to link for uh, proper bidding mechanism, market clearing by the power exchange, which is taking care of both the pool transaction as well as the bilateral transaction with the accurate forecast received from the uh, discounts. Okay. But if you see the right hand side, yesterday I was uh, emphasizing this very important point that the system operator is a brain of the system today, which has a main responsibility of monitoring, controlling the entire path facilities. And uh, this is possible only with some services to be procured in a market, uh, which are essentially required for the uh, better operation of a system. And these services we call as the ancillary services. Since uh, in Indian electricity market, we have the TSO model. So ancillary services owner and provider is the system operator called as TSO for the better coordination with the uh, ancillary services provision, which are required, by, required at the different levels. So this is the main topic of today. Uh, about the ancillary services. So you see, this is one of the main segment of the uh, competitive markets today, and uh, it has to be solved well with the uh, proper requirement of the different kind of components in a system for better operating conditions. This 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 was the uh, basically linking with your entire transmission structure, but uh, I think patch is appearing again. Uh, this is okay. Yeah. So uh, we have to be very, uh, very careful for this model. Today uh, we have a distribution network uh, operator as a one of the important element, which is also the brain of the distribution system today. Uh, as I informed earlier that uh, there is not only a bulk power market, which is called as the, which is managed by the power exchange and the independent system operator with a coordination. And uh, we have today the distribution uh, con uh, market concept where the uh, distribution network operator or distribution system operator, which is called as DSO or DNO. This uh, DNO is coming out to be important element as a brain element in the uh, distribution system chain. Why this has become possible? Because we have the uh, renewable sources, which are at a lower voltage level connected to the grid. Okay, we have come to the concept of the micro grids. We have come, uh, came to the concept of nano grids or pico grids. So these all grids, uh, small, small grids taking care of the power locally and uh, the power which is uh, available with the consumers, where the consumers today are known as the prosumers because they are consuming power as well as they are producing power. 
So few kilowatts of the power from the solar or uh, from electrical vehicles that can be added into the network at the time of requirement. So the distribution network is very complex today, not simple as earlier, which was a passive in nature, but today we have an active distribution system with bidirectional power flows due to the integration of the renewable components and uh, the power which is available at a lower level of few kilowatts to a few megawatts that is being integrated into the distribution network today. So distribution a network is to be managed like a transmission network uh, as a bulk power market. Why? Because of the distributed energy sources which are coming up in addition to the electrical vehicles to be connected to the grid or in addition to the very uh, energy storage elements, energy storage systems, which are called as the fast energy storage system, ESS. So all these elements are to be added uh, to this network, making it very complex in operation. And uh, there has to be a brain, brain child behind the operation of this network as a distribution system operator. So distribution system operator is, uh, you see, uh, is linking directly with the consumers. The consumers are consumers as well. So they, they are, they are bi-directional kind of the power. They can consume as well supply to the system. There are third party uh, distributed energy sources being connected to the uh, network. And uh, this all have to be managed very nicely, making the entire data available at a central level of the distribution network operator. And this entire data has to be definitely shared uh, because of the all these integrated generation components they can have an impact on the system operation in terms of frequency regulation, in terms of voltage control, in terms of uh, the security and stability. So the grid control at a distribution level is also very, very important. Okay, Earlier we were talking of the grid control only at a very high voltage level, but today uh, the grid control at a distribution level has become very, very important. That is to be taken care by a new element, which is uh, introduced in the market called as the DM. Okay. So responsibilities of DNO are similar as the responsibilities of the ISO I discussed uh, yesterday. So all these responsibilities uh, uh, are to be taken care and ultimately the distribution uh, grid need to be very well managed and ultimately connecting the distribution grid and the entire data to be uh, flown to the ISO power exchange. Uh, okay, and uh, we have an important phase here, the bulk system and the distribution network, which is to be taken care. So this is how the emerging distribution uh, with the distribution energy sources market has come up uh, with the existing bulk market. So both of these market have to be operated in coordination in consonance. Otherwise, uh, the parameters, health parameters of the system will not be uh, will not be within the standard limits, and system will not operate uh, in a stable manner. So this is how the distribution network grid operated by, uh, managed by distribution system operator, okay? And uh, the bulk system, which is operated by the ISO, needs the proper coordination with the TF and entire data at a distribution level is being taken care by the uh, ICT information and communication technology through the hardware and software interface to the system operator at the central level. So this is the importance of uh, successful operation of both the markets. This gives a very important information to all the participants that uh, we have a 11 kV or 440 volt distribution substation. Uh, we have a, a 11 kV uh, grid here. And uh, to this grid at a level of the 440 volt or 11 kV, there can be the distributed generators uh, which are being managed, which are taken care by the uh, agents. We call, we call them as the generation, generation system agents. Okay, There can be a large number of the agents, GSA1, GSA2, GSA3. Uh, which are taking care of the distributed generation at a lower level of voltage. Okay, so we this is a physical layer of the micro, uh, physical layer of the microgrid. So large number of the generation station agents uh, are there as a very important element. Then uh, this 440 volt or 230 volt supply with a three phase four bar system available to the consumers. So we have a uh, we have a here the agents which are taking care of the consumer. So CA1, CA2, CA3, and CA, and these are the agents which are taking care of the distribution to the different uh, area, maybe the commercial sector, maybe the residential sector, maybe the industrial sector. So in addition to this, there is another uh, important element which is, which, is, which is emerging very fast in the system with the static storage devices and mobile storage devices. While uh, energy storage system will be the future where we do require the uh, 
to offer services as an important ancillary services for better operation at a lower level of voltage. We will have a facility of the mobile services in future. Okay, I will quote you a very important example here. Why mobile ancillary services? For example, you you have a car with you, and you are driving to some uh, some area, or you are driving to some city. On the way, there is a problem with the car. So what will you do? You have phone numbers with you, and the nearest uh, service station you can call, and they will they will immediately come to you. Will check up your car if there is a battery problem or if there is a starting problem, or if there is any other problem in a vehicle, they will immediately check up, bringing their gadgets and uh, giving you service, uh, mobile service at your uh, point where you, where you are standing. This kind of service in the market is already already there. We call these as a mobile services. Similar kind of the mobile service concept is coming for the electricity sector as well. So whenever there is the requirement of system operation, uh, uh, okay, so mobile ancillary services will be there as an important energy storage system. So this is coming out to be a very important component here, okay. Then we have static and uh, energy storage services. So these all services will not be free. They have to be paid, okay, for their services. And uh, uh, the payment mechanism is on the way uh, to be under the stage of development. There have to be proper rules and regulations for the uh, for making the payments to these all ancillary services provider. So entire this data at this level that has to be taken care of by a important agent which is called as the market agent. Okay, so this market agent. At a, uh, at a at a distribution level is taking all the data base, all the data from all these important components and sharing this important information to central market agent. Okay, so this is a central market agent which is uh, taking care of uh, all the generators as a distributed system and all the consumers, okay, all the consumers, all the uh, your uh, storage devices, okay. so. All this data at a central market agent uh, as an important market layer will be taken care of by the utility agent. So this is how the data flow is there uh, in the form of uh, your, uh, your uh, as a database for uh, different uh, rules and regulations to be followed for proper management of the voltage, frequency, and other parameters. And this utility agent is then sharing this entire information with the central operator. Okay, central agent. This is how the data is flowing. So we have a two facets here. One is the physical layer, another is the uh, your uh, market layer, where we have the double auction market or a single auction market, uh, which will bid in the market for their services to the consumers. And accordingly, uh, for this this bid, once it is cleared in the distribution network operator uh, state, the service providers will be paid. So this is how the concept is evolving, and uh, some of the countries they have already they are already going for this kind of the uh, agent way system for entire system operation very smart so this this concept will also come in future in indian electricity market as well where we will have the all kind of facilities at the distribution network side with a proper management of system so once you understand uh, this concept that why the services have, be, have become very essential you can now have a distinction between the uh, your uh, conventional grid and the smart grid. So uh, this this is uh, quite evident and visible from this picture that earlier the system operation was uh, this with a conventional generation through the transmission path and ultimately going the power uh, to at a distribution level. But now we have the segregation of the different kind of the plants. Lower size plants are also coming in picture with a CHP based technology combined heat and power. Or CCGT based technology or micro turbine based technology, CCGT combined cycle gas turbine, which are of modular in nature, uh, period of execution is very small. And at a lower level of voltage, we have a much more generation with a very high efficiency as well as the efficiency of the bigger plants that is coming in, uh, that, that has already been added in a system. And the distribution grid is very, very important with the generation as well as supply to the different uh, consumers and both the wind solar connected at a lower level of voltage in a network. So this is how the evolution of the power system network from conventional to smart grid has changed. Okay. So this, this is the requirement that uh, the complexity of the network, if you see this network and uh, this network, the complexity here is uh, typical. So for successful operation, for secure operation, for stable operation, the management of this entire system with a distribution network operator at a distribution grid side, 
and transmission network of your cluster. Transmission side with better coordination between them is essential. Uh, with the the distributed energy sources connected in a system, which need to be operated very smartly. Okay, so this is how there is a need of the energy services for better operation. Uh, based on this uh, idea, uh, so smart grid has uh, many threats. If you understand those threats, the ancillary services uh, you can you, you can absorb immediately. That uh, definitely for smart grid security, uh, since sources of threats may be infrastructural, the threats may be technical, uh, operational, the threats may be from system data management, the threats may be, may be from the environmental security, and definitely government regulatory policies. They have to be. Uh, they have to take care of all these uh, important aspects for uh, secure operation of a system. So because of all these threats, especially the technical threats which are appearing in a system, uh, okay, uh, this, this, this has a must to as a requirement of the ancillary services in a system. So all these threats uh, require today that uh, the network need to be operated uh, in a secure manner and there have to be certain services, especially from the technical point of view, uh, taking into account the technical operating security of a system. So we need to have the ancillary services as a very important market in the competitive structure. So the first part is over, uh, giving you why there is a need of the ancillary services and what are the issues in a smart grid where ancillary services is a major requirement today. So why ancillary services? You have understood, but this picture gives a very important information to you that uh, we have to keep a balance between the demand and the, this is a demand at one side of the, uh, your balance. This is the generation at one side of the balance. This generation and demand must balance in real time. Okay. So if there is a more requirement uh, from demand side, definitely the reserves have to be there. These reserves will be added here to meet this demand, making the perfect balance between the uh, generation and the demand. So this is how the frequency need to be hover around uh, your plus than one percent. Okay. Otherwise, there is a frequency expansion, and there is a important stability aspect because of the frequency. We call it as a frequency stability. So very smartly, you see this figure. How the reserve has to be added to make the uh, more requirement of the demand in a market, and keep keeping whenever the demand is less, generation is high. We have to take out the reserve very fast from the system making our uh, regulation of a system very, very uh, stable. So this picture gives an idea that uh, balance is very, very important. Otherwise, what will happen? That uh, system frequency uh, will go down or will be high. So we have to be very careful in making this frequency uh, near to the 50 or 60 hertz. Okay. So what are the ancillary services? That is another question now. You have, you have understood such services which are essentially required for the system operation to maintain the operation in a reliable, secure, and stable manner. Such services are called as ancillary services. What are these ancillary services? They, they have to maintain the proper power flow, direction of the electricity, address the imbalances between supply and demand in real time, and this help the network operator to recover whenever there is any casualty in a system any catastrophe in a system, the network operator, system operator must recover uh, very fastly the system to the normal state. Otherwise, there will be the uh, huge loss of uh, economy because of the loss of uh, uh, energy in a market. And this loss will not be sustained in future because economically, if the market is weak, then it will not sustain itself and we cannot have a, a reliable system, perfect reliable system. Okay. So these ancillary services uh, include synchronized regulation. Okay, so whenever there is a short-term changes in a network uh, due to the imbalances of generation and demand, okay, which can affect the stability of the network from frequency regulation point of view, we need to have synchronized regulation, perfect synchronized regulation. We need to have contingency reserves, okay, which must respond whenever there is a unexpected casualty in a system or failure in a system or outage of the component. Okay, there may be outage of generator, there may be outage of transmission system or distribution line, or there may be the outage of the circuit breaker because of the component failures. There may be outage of the switches or other electrical element. So we must have a contingency reserves available with us for 
uh, better operation. Black start regulation is very black. Black start means that whenever there is a catastrophe because of the uh, rain, heavy rain because of the uh, your uh, fall of uh, uh, transmission structures because of very high wind velocity, because of other tsunami kind of system which come because of the earthquake. So there is a complete blackout of a system. So how to restore the system back? There has to be the certain services to bring the system back. Such services which revive the system from a complete shutdown, we call that as a black start regulation. So these are three categorization of the uh, basic main categorization of the ancillary services to make our system better. So this is uh, uh, three were the main components, but they are categorized into six as per the uh, FERC regulation, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We have uh, six ancillary services which are well identified. Okay, the six ancillary services are regulation service, synchronized reserve service, day head scheduling reserve, black star service, voltage control, and deputy power. So there are six important ancillary services which are categorized in the basket of ancillary services. Okay. So we can have a brief explanation overview of these services. Those who are planning to have uh, the research in this area or already we have those who have done work in this uh, ancillary services. There is a the, the ancillary services specific to the distribution side is still in a novice stage. So we need to have a lot of uh, research outcome, research input to this uh, services, especially in a smart grid domain. So it is it is essentially required that you must understand these services. So regulation service, okay. As as I told you that uh, regulation service is categorized as one of the ancillary services, and uh, uh, this has to be uh, the respond very quickly whenever there is a change in the demand as well as the generation and uh, regulation signal must go immediately to the generator to control its power and making or adding a reserve very fast in the system to make frequency uh, near the original frequency of a system. Okay. So th this regulation service as a frequency regulation is very important. So resource revenue is very important here because when, once we have the generators or reserve available with us, these reserve are not free. They need to be uh, provide revenue. Okay. Otherwise they will not sustain. So revenue uh, decision by the regulatory body as well as how they will be paid. What will be the mechanism that need to be developed? Okay. So many, many articles are coming for the uh, cost of the reserve services to be paid to the service providers. So regulation service in terms of the frequency is very, very important. Okay, synchronized reserve facility. Okay, whenever there is sudden loss of generation or a loss of the transmission capability. So uh, we will not be able to take care of the additional uh, power requirement or power requirement under such situation. So we have to have a demand response program somewhere or a uh, aggregate demand response program or aggregate demand response resources have to be there so that the usage of the electricity during that time is uh, lower or reduced so that we can uh, have a better uh, parameters, health parameters, voltage and control in our system. So this is called reserve has to be there. So this reserve need to be synchronized very fast in a system. So for example, we have additional generation requirement. It must be put into the system very fast. Okay, we have uh, uh, we don't require the additional generation. It has to be taken out of the system very fast. So such kind, such kind of the synchronized reserve uh, need to be there in a system. And uh, whenever we need, we have a reserve available. So we we call it as a headroom, headroom on a system. We have capability available with us. Hello. So synchronized reserve service uh, availability is very, very important. Okay. So whenever there is a high demand, we must have a reserve to be added in a system. Whenever the demand is lower, we must take out of the reserve very fast out of the system so that uh, all the health parameters are maintained properly within the limits. So we must have day head scheduling reserve. The reserve which we uh, dispatch in a system in one day ahead market, we call it as a day ahead scheduling reserve. Okay, this has to be cleared. A uh, day ahead, we call it as a day ahead market for for uh, scheduling reserve. So this day ahead scheduling reserve is very important, and availability has to be there within 30 minutes uh, in a real time market, and it, to meet the demand. 
black stock service as i told you that uh, this is essential whenever there is the catastrophe and uh, we need to bring the system uh, out of this catastrophe we have to revive system again so because of uh, these blackouts which can happen many times in the system because of uh, sudden load increase or because of more reactive requirements or because of the component failures because of cascading the failure of the transmission system so there is a critical requirement of the uh, stations to provide as a black start but they need to be paid for that so what will be the payment mechanism because the reserve is always available uh, whenever there is a requirement and it can be put into the system very fast so this black start reserve has to be paid accordingly okay so this is one of the important ancillary service categorized as black start service so voltage control and directive service very very important uh, dr gupta discussed about the directive power management in a distribution network uh, especially with the dstatcom so dstatcom or uh, svc or uh, tcsc or upfc at a transmission level dstatcom or dis distributed fax devices at a distribution level with fast energy storage system is the future so they they are very important uh, importantly required in a system okay uh, being the local requirement they can be mobile in nature so mobile ancillary services for voltage control and directive power management is a future and uh, these can be uh, connected uh, very fast in a network to make uh, the voltage control especially the secondary voltage control okay so primary voltage control services uh, have to be very fastly added in a system by the this platform which operated which operate in a uh, smaller time time frame within few seconds to uh, 10 of seconds but uh, once the voltage is supported we need to put the devices like uh, capacitive banks or uh, other voltage control voltage regulators okay uh, such devices need to be put in a system for voltage control and directive power management. So this is one of the important ancillary services called as the voltage control and directive power management. So if voltage, uh, if voltage is proper, then the losses in a network will be lower as uh, you have been given an example by Professor Kapoor yesterday that if we connect a DG in a system that how the current behavior is changing in a lines and how the I square R loss will reduce. So DGs as an important answer service provider to control the voltage is the future in a distribution network. And in addition to this, the uh, you can, uh, with proper voltage control, the active real losses are lower, absence of system goes high, and uh, the life of the equipment which are uh, operating at suitable level of voltage, they are in, that increases. So in turn, you are getting the societal gain, because if your health parameter, voltage parameter is very good, then, uh, uh, in addition to the losses, the life of the equipment is very, very good. So life of the equipment is good. This means that you need not to invest for the transformer installation time and again. Uh, the cost is deferred and ultimately utilities is getting an advantage in terms of money. So this in advantage in terms of money can be allocated. Some component can be allocated to the uh, service providers. So this mechanism needs to be developed in future. So you can think of, uh, I will take an example in the end, giving you the idea that how the costs have to be taken care for the voltage control service, selective of deployment service or frequency service. So to understand the uh, voltage control behavior, very important to go for generator capability curve. I think uh, we do this curve analysis in a uh, synchronous generator uh, in electrical machine too. And uh, at a BTEC level, we, 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 we discuss all these that how the generator operate in a different state in a lagging power factor mode or leading power factor mode. This capability uh, generator provides to a system with the real power flow as well as directive power flow under, under a base case, okay? So we call it as a generator capability chart. So if you look at generator is uh, responsible to give you the real power and directive power for its operation, okay? For example, if you have a 100 megawatt generator, then as a thumb rule, 10% of the power will be required as a reactive support to a generator. Only then it will generate the power. Otherwise, the generator cannot generate the real power. So we have a base case reactive requirement already for a system for which there is no payment. But when we need to have more reactive support in a system, then definitely the real power will go down at this point, from this point to this point, okay? This is the maximum real power which a generator can provide. But if you need the more reactive power under this over excitation uh, system following this OER limit, okay? So we cannot move beyond the stator binding limit or excitation limiter. We will operate within this region for the generator. So generator can is a, is a very important source of reactive support. So generator 
synchronous generator provides directive power, but if you don't re re require re re real power from the generator, we call it as a synchronous condenser. So synchronous condensers are also connected in a system which operate uh, very fast. They control the voltage very fastly. Okay, but they are, they are the mechanism of secondary voltage control. Okay, so this is a capability uh, following the stator and over excitation limiter, heating limits. And if it is under excited more than the directive power need to be absorbed by a generator. So this, this state we don't operate, but it may happen in a system and generator must have capability to absorb the directive power. Otherwise, what will happen? The voltage will swell in a system because of the swelling of this voltage. What will happen? Insulation failure. But if you see, if you compare the capability here and capability here, okay, so this capability is lower. Why? Because there is a stator and iron heat limit. This, this causes the capability of the generator to be lower in the under excitation operation compared to the over excitation operation. So most commonly generators are operating in a lag in, in a over excitation mode with a lagging power factor. But whenever the directive, because directive power is very fishy, this is not uh, controlled so fastly and it requires the complete observation of the voltage behavior uh, at particular nodes, at all the nodes in a system. And uh, generators can absorb directive power, but we avoid it because of the heating process in a, they, they can absorb it for a small time, but a uh, few hours, but for a longer term, it is not advisable to operate the generator in this reason because of the stator and heating which may fail over the generator cooling system. Okay, so this is the generator capabilities, which is very, very important to understand. And based on this capability, we can have a cost criteria. Uh, how much cost you forego? For example, you want to provide the, this much of active power in a network. Then you have a real power, this much real power. So this is the real power which you are losing in a market. So this real power cost, you need to be taken out of the market in terms of the reactive cost. So you can develop a criteria based on this real tracing of the curve, that what will be the cost of active support. So uh, once you understand the capability of a generator, maybe the synchronous generator, maybe the wind generator, because uh, your uh, induction generator, they absorb the reactive power from a system, but uh, we have the permanent synchronous generating machine also connected to the wind system as a wind generator, so they have the capability to supply the reactive support. So they can also supply reactive support as well as inertia to a system for frequency control, okay? So because of the um, high penetration of the uh, converter uh, operated distributed renewable energy sources, which are commonly called as DRES at a distribution level, they, 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 they have been gradually replacing the conventional generators, okay? And security stability changes are coming in the form of frequency regulation because their inertia is lower as compared to the synchronous generators. So we need to think of that how the battery will have inertia or the solar system will have inertia or storage devices will have inertia. That inertia, virtual inertia need to be computed for uh, better services in a system, okay? So definitely there is a, a change in complete operation of a system throughout the globe uh, with a introduction of the smart grid technology. So ancillary services in the smart grid has emerged as important issues that need to be taken care of in future. And um, there is a huge scope of research in this area. So existing ancillary services uh, and uh, what will be the new ancillary services at a distribution level with the uh, integration of the renewable resources. We have a more uh, area to ponder upon is the nurture response, the active power ramp control, okay? How actively you can adapt a power in the system to meet the demand. That is what we require. Because conventional generator, their uh, generator, their uh, rotor size is very, very big, rotor weight is very, very uh, high. So uh, there is a natural uh, uh, capability of the generator to meet, to take control of the frequency. But since we are going for the CHP based system, which, are, um, which have lower shaft, lower bed shaft, we have uh, your distributed generators, their, their shaft weight is not much. So we, we have a, a lower, lower energy available in the system. So definitely we need to keep the faster power input in a system to, to uh, take care of the energy in the system. So frequency reform, voltage regulation, as well as the fault contribution, the harmonic mitigation, they are the additional points, fault contribution and harmonic mitigation as one of the ancillary services in a 
distribution systems, especially in smart grid area. But we must understand the barriers, technical, regulatory, financial. Okay, these are the barriers. Uh, we need to understand them very clearly. And once we understand these barriers, definitely the outcome will be there in terms of certain mechanisms, technical, financial, regulatory, as a regulatory policy for the ancillary service provision in a system. So uh, th these were the basic uh, uh, understanding of the and philosophy of the subject. So now what we have done, I will quickly overview of existing ancillary services. The first ancillary service is frequency control. We discussed it with a very important example of a balance. Whenever more load is required, we need to put more generation in the system. But since we are going for a faster generation uh, with a lower inertia system, so we need to have the generation which is available very, very fast in a network with a storage devices system or micro hydro uh, system which, which can be put in a system within uh, 10 minutes of time, okay, uh, in a uh, few minutes time in a system. So uh, frequency control is essential because of uh, lowering the frequency or big frequency is high, the equipments may fail, okay. Uh, there can be the failure of the equipments in term of the uh, in term of the speed or uh, if frequency goes high, the equipment may fail. If frequency goes low, there will be a more thrust, more requirement from a soft side, soft mid start or uh, your your equipments will not function at a frequency. Okay, so there can be accidents in the industry if frequency is lower. We have a very important uh, uh, point here, which is called a stroboscopic effect. If your frequency goes down below 50 hertz, near to 45 hertz, the what what happened that machine which is rotating does not appear to be rotating. So there can be accident. It has happened many times. So frequency has to be within the band. So this is uh, the importance of the frequency regulation. Okay. So these active power reserves to control the frequency will be generator units, which can be put into the system very fast, as storage devices, and in some cases whenever there is no storage of generation available. To be connected to a system, we need to have demand response program, which will cut their demand uh, based on the requirements. So demand response programs is a challenge as a one very important as services coming in the uh, distribution side. So main ancillary services, uh, you must understand, uh, which are offered as a frequency regulation, as a frequency restoration. We call it as a primary frequency control, okay, which operate within 30 seconds in a decentralized manner, okay, especially in a synchronized area. Frequency restoration reserves, we call it a secondary frequency control. We have reserve available with us. They need to be put in the system within 30 seconds, okay, in an in interval of 30 seconds and 50 minutes. So we must have a very fast restoration reserve available, bus, available with us to control frequency, called as FRR, okay. Then we have replacement reserves, which is called as tertiary frequency control because the faster reserve will not act for more time. So now we need to keep the frequency control for longer time. So we need to adapt them in the network as a trusted frequency control, uh, which is generally manual and uh, activation time is more than 15 minutes up to a few hours. So these replacement reserves need to be there and definitely uh, the cost has to be there for these reserves, for these components. So this is a typical frequency variation curve taken from the literature. So if the frequency is hovering like this, there is no problem. This is a uh, dynamic behavior, behavior of a synchronous generator and uh, we do not have much of the problem because frequency is very near to the 50 hertz. But if any incident happen at uh, some time at this position and frequency goes down, the rate of change of frequency called as rock off, which is very, very large, okay? And the frequency dip to this point, 49.2, which is well below the 50 hertz, it can cause a impact, huge impact on the system behavior. So here is the primary requirement because your uh, inertia of the system will take care of the inertia is very, very high, but if inertia is not there within uh, 10 seconds to 30 seconds, we need to add up the dynamic reserve in a system very, very fast. So fast energy storage system or micro hydro, which can be switched very fast into a system, this primary reserve we will take care. We will add up in a system to bring this frequency to this value. This value. So this ramp is very important here. This ramp time will be decided by the dynamic behavior of a system. So we can have a lower ramp or higher ramp. 
So how much ramp is there? This is totally dependent on the dynamic nature of a primary reserve. Once primary reserve has brought the frequency to 49.5, we are safe. So we have reached uh, within a band here. Now we can add up to bring this frequency to 50 hertz normal. We need to have a, a reserves within a 30 minutes to a few hours of time. So the enough reserves are available with us that can be the uh, your CHB based plants or your distributed generators or uh, a reserve in terms of the uh, your uh, additional generators available in the system. Okay, so micro hydrals they can be put as a uh, tertiary frequency control. So we can bring the frequency to normal value within this time. But our system is not stressed. But this this rate of change of frequency in this region is very typical. This needs to be taken care of by the primary reserves very, very fast. So this is one of the typical requirement of a system to make our system stable. Then voltage control uh, and uh, reactive power uh, I've already talked about. So there are certain uh, important components as a primary voltage control, as a secondary voltage control, as a tertiary voltage control. Primary voltage control is the uh, is provided by your fast excitation system because um, all of you know that we have excitation control. So excitation can operate very, very fast. Okay, today we have electronic exciters. So all these generators, modern generators are fitted with the uh, static exciters today. Their excitation behavior is very, very good. They can bring the voltage to ceiling point very fast. So primary voltage control cannot uh, operate for a longer time, but they bring the voltage to some value immediately. Now here we have to go for the secondary voltage control as a secondary devices like automatic voltage regulators, AVRs to need to be put in a system. Okay, and uh, uh, static war compensators also operate very fast as a as a dynamic reserve. Okay, capacitor banks then at the third stage at a tertiary voltage control. Uh, or the distributed generator system or capacitor banks can be provided immediately at a uh, in a system okay at a suitable time to make the voltage uh, to the normal state this is a brief idea about the automatic voltage regulation of a synchronous generator they are fitted with the exciter with the amplification behavior okay earlier we were using amplidine uh, you, you must uh, remember what is amplidine so they were uh, the voltage was sensed. Okay, this voltage sensor caused caused the amplidine to raise the output here, and thrusting the excitor to control the voltage. But nowadays we have static exciters available with us, which can operate quite fast. Static wall compensators. They are also the dynamic devices which can switch on, you know, which can dynamically control the voltage in this range, in this uh, in this slope range, and whenever there is a uh, there is a requirement voltage goes down it operates capacitive and when voltage is high act as inductive so this is the range of operation of the static war compensators bringing the voltage very near to the operating point so they also operate very fast as a dynamic resources okay and uh, capacitor banks as a tertiary component they can be switched then slowly in a network uh, because they can introduce transients so the switching behavior is very important here but nowadays we have first control capacitor banks which are continu continuous, which operate continuously. So voltage control, uh, uh, I, as I talked, you use a three level hierarchy structure as the frequency control, primary frequency, secondary frequency, tertiary frequency. In a similar manner, we have got voltage control action in a three uh, hierarchical level, primary voltage control, as I told you, to be activated within few seconds to minutes, secondary voltage control, taken care by the uh, your, uh, automatic voltage regulators, automatic control action within minutes to several minutes, 10 of minutes, firstly voltage, voltage control can be to 30 minutes by the uh, devices as reactive reserve devices, maybe synchronous condensers, maybe the crystal banks, maybe the distributed generators, okay, they need to be connected in a system in this era, okay, but for all these services, uh, there have to be a payment because the devices are costly, so they need to be paid. So how the voltage control as a voltage control price component need to be computed? There are few papers appeared in the literature where voltage uh, control is uh, computed in the form of the cost. So how much cost need to be paid to, to this service providers? Black star capability, I have already talked about who will provide the black star capability. What are the technologies available which include the black start capability grid restoration under the blackouts from the storage plant can be operated very fast within 30 minutes. 
we have interconnections. Their power can be imported from the nearby area. Okay, hydro plants. Okay, micro gas and nuclear plants can be switched very fast. So these are the technologies available uh, to provide the black start capability. But we need to provide the cost to them because they are always waiting for you whenever there is the casualty. So they need most of the time idle, but uh, they have to be maintained properly. So the cost of the maintenance, cost of operation, and uh, the real cost whenever they supply to the system. These all three components need to be added uh, for the payment. So now all these aspects uh, regarding the basic components uh, we have discussed. Then answer is service market design. What 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 could be the possible design of the conventional uh, ancillary service market and the future ancillary service market, especially in a smart grid domain? So three main balancing processes, uh, as I told you, exist in an ancillary service market. One is the central dispatching system. Second is the self dispatch portfolio based system, and third is the self dispatch unit based system. Okay, so three main balancing processes exist in the ancillary service market: central dispatch taken care by the TSO or ISO, self-dispatch, which is taken care by the bilateral negotiation like uh, generator itself, and uh, self-dispatch unit-based system uh, is also taken care by the distributed sources in a network. This already we have talked about, but there is a, uh, here in this model, the power exchange is taking care of the both pool transaction and bilateral transaction. Pool means which are, uh, uh, which are maintained between the distributors, disforms, and genetic stations through power exchange. But there can be the transaction directly between the competing generators and discoms, like this. They need not to have the power exchange involvement for the transaction uh, settlement. This can be directly done between the two entities, competing generators and distributors. We call it as a scheduling coordinators. This scheduling coordinator, they take care of the bilateral transactions. Uh, uh, especially in the California electricity market. So California power exchange has two exchanges. One is power exchange uh, for pool. Another is uh, the civil coordinator for taking care of bilateral. So in the Indian market, we don't have this. Power exchange is taking care of both pool and bilateral. So this is the difference that uh, bilateral negotiation can be done by the uh, civil coordinators, but uh, both the pool and bilateral is taken care by power exchange in this model, in TSO model. And uh, uh, in Indian electricity market, uh, the pilot exchange is around 10%. So the, in, the interest is increasing between the generators and discoms, and in future we can have uh, more and more bilateral. So we have a hybrid kind of market today, and uh, with more share of the bilateral in future. But in many countries, the bilateral is 50-50, 50 bilateral, 50 pool. So you see the huge amount of, uh, uh, you see the confidence between the different players in the market for going to the bilateral negotiation. But bilateral negotiation is generally for the bulk consumers. So big industries, they can have bi bilateral negotiation directly. But uh, the pool, like residential consumers, small industry consumers, or uh, your uh, commercial consumers, they have the pool kind of projection. They cannot go for bilateral because of the lower amount of people are in the power. So what is a central dispatch? What is a self-dispatch portfolio-based model? Uh, what is a self-dispatch unit-based model? You must understand the difference. In a central dispatch, the dispatching is carried out by the central operator called as TSO. So entire dispatching is taken care by the TSO. Okay. In a self-dispatch-based model, as an ancillary service model, the aggregated generation schedules and consumption. Okay, they are taken care by agents, and these agents are called scheduling agents. So that this duty is performed by the scheduling agents in a self-dispatch portfolio-based model. And in a self-dispatch unit-based model, each generating system and demand facility follow their own generation and consumption schedule. They are responsible for balance between the generation and demand on their own. Okay. So these are three kinds of the insurance market, but most important market is generally the central dispatch and portfolio-based model. This model is uh, not, not much more prevalent, but uh, these two models exist. Okay, but in many countries, in the, uh, we, we don't have the uh, TSO kind of uh, competitive structure, so each generator is taking care of the demand responsibility, means the electricity boards or they are responsible for meeting the generation load demands. And the procurement methods, they are categorized into four main categories. 
it is compulsory provision. It can be bilateral contract. It can be through tendering mechanism or it can be there in a spot market. So the selling buying process can happen or the procurement process can happen in a compulsory provision manner, bilateral contract manner, tendering manner and spot market. So these are the four kind of processes which exist in the market for ancillary services procurement. So uh, let me take five minutes rest. Uh, yes, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, take a five minutes break. Uh, uh, so that not five minutes, two, three minutes break, then I will again stop. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Participants okay. will also take a glass of water or tea, anything they want. Five minute break. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. We will stay here and we will start uh, from here only.
Dr. Gupta, I'm back. Okay, sir. We may start from uh, here. We may start. Path is appearing again. Na? How it's okay? Uh, now, okay, sir. Now, okay. So, I was discussing with you all the different kind of provisions to procure the ancillary services. In a compulsory provision, as the name suggests, it is compulsory to provide the direct support, okay, for better operation of a system, which is compulsory for the generators, okay. So we have a certain class of generators, which are specially engaged to provide this service as a specific reserve services, and these special generators are under the category of compulsory provision. So this is under the regulatory body. Okay, so as per the uh, regulatory commission and uh, other uh, network boards which are there for the different countries, so we have uh, this uh, this compulsory provision services for the generators for which they need not to be paid. Okay, that is already already included in, under the regulatory provision for the payment. Okay, so uh, if this is not the case, then uh, sorry. In, in case of the bilateral contract, in a bilateral contract market, the transmission system operator has a capability to negotiate with the service provider for a particular quantity of the MBR or KBR as a reactive support and the cost component which is uh, to be offered for the service. So in a bilateral contract, we have a negotiation of the service in the form of the KBR or MBR requirement and at what price this is decided by the bilateral negotiation and we call this kind of the contract or market as a bilateral contract market. Okay. And uh, generally this cont uh, the contracts may be long term contracts. Okay. But in the last two methods, uh, the tendering method and the spot market, they are, they are highly competitive methods. In a tendering method, we, we, we offer the tender, which may be the online tender, okay, or uh, tender posted on the newspapers. But mostly we have online mechanism for the tendering process and under this tender many companies they can compete for service provision and uh, they can compete both technically and uh, commercially economically wherever is the price negotiation the tender is cleared and the services are provided to the ancillary services providers this patch is appearing i think again now it's okay In a spot market, which is a generally the intraday market, okay, uh, we have a uh, market clearing for the ancillary services, and uh, we have a selling and buying process where the bidding mechanism is there for uh, the service provider at a particular price. The market is cleared in real time, and this is highly competitive both tendering and spot market. Uh, in some countries, there is a spot market mechanism for uh, ancillary services provision, and in some countries, uh, we have a day ahead market as well existing for. Uh, balancing services, ancillary services provision, and there is a long term market as well, uh, especially in the bilateral negotiation. Uh, we have a long term market for ancillary services requirement. So, this is a cost characteristic curve, uh, which is well uh, developed. Okay, uh, you can read a thesis by Jin Hong. Uh, she has done the work in the area of the ancillary services provision in the electricity market and the costing analysis. So this is a cost curve, okay, for this, uh, for this service at this point here, this is the uh, certain currency for MBR requirement, okay, this is the active power requirement. So this, from this point to this point, okay, there is a constant value of the cost, and uh, from this point to this point, if active power is required, then the cost is varying linearly, and if active power requirement is very, very high, then the cost can become according to this slope, okay. So the slopes have been well de uh, derived in the form of certain mathematical functions. You can see this thesis and uh, how the directive power is uh, costed as ancillary services, especially for the voltage control. Okay, and uh, this this is in the lagging power factor region. This is the leading power factor region. The cost is uh, linearly varying. Okay, so we have a cost curves, especially with the cost characteristics A0, A1, A2, A3 uh, in a lagging or leading region, uh, especially developed for the ancillary service providers. And accordingly, this cost 
the NCG service providers can be remunerated. But uh, this is a research which is there especially for the NCG service procurement services and cost. This need to be adopted by the regulatory body for final execution in the electricity markets. So there can be uh, the proposals from uh, uh, researcher side that how the cost need to be determined. Then uh, uh, some of my students also work in this area, especially to the cost component. So as the generator characteristic, have you seen? Uh, you have seen the generator characteristic. It is non-linear in nature. So the cost behavior is uh, not uh, linear, but it should be non-linear. So in a suitable range from zero uh, to base case, there can be no cost. Okay, there can be zero cost, or there can be a fixed cost, fixed cost component. From base case to certain level where uh, QA, there can be a linear variation, but from QA to QB, instead of a linear variation, there can be no linear variation as per the generator capability chart. So all this, this, this cost from Q base to QA may not be linear. It, it is non-linear in nature as per the characteristic of the generator characteristic curve. So accordingly, this, uh, these curves can be plotted. Okay. Similarly, in their leading region also, we have uh, the non-linear cost characteristics. And this cost characteristic uh, function can be developed based on the database. You can generate database for different rectifier requirements for different size of generators, and you can plot them as an important uh, curve fitting technique. So these all curves are plotted based on the curve fitting base, but you need to have a data generation for different generators based on their capability and requirement of directive support from these, uh, these generators as a ancillary service. And this cost which is paid to the generator because of the loss in the real power generation, we call it as a lost opportunity cost. Because we are foregoing certain cost because of the real power reduction, and we are generating more reactive power from the generator. So this uh, cost which we are uh, foregoing in a market because of the reduction in the real power cost has to be recovered from the uh, players in the market, okay, from the agents, from the consumer in the market, with a certain uh, characteristics, okay? And uh, this cost must match with the cost of the real power generation, which you are following in a market. So this is how the cost criteria can be developed. So uh, this was the overall idea of the all ancillary services, especially in a, uh, in a previous domain, but uh, since new ancillary services are emerging, because of the distributed generation concept, because of the distributed renewable energy sources connected in a market, uh, in, a, in a system. So procurement schemes will slightly change, especially in a distribution system side uh, compared to the transmission system side. So definitely, uh, what is the change which is happening for the ancillary service procurement because of the uh, increased renewable energy uh, source penetration? This needs to be taken care in the future markets. So therefore, New ancillary services uh, or uh, the currently ancillary services which are to be proposed, okay, and uh, in a highly interconnected system, especially uh, which is operating in a smart grid area, we need to have certain other mechanisms added in the system so that the new ancillary services can be proved. So this is a sort of comparison between the ancillary services which were existing previously. What are new ancillary services in the context of the renewable energy sources integration, especially in the distribution side. So this is how we have a slight change, okay? We had a main frequency control service, voltage control directives, support service, black start capability service. These were the main services, three main services existing in a uh, previous regime, but today we have the new kind of ancillary services which are taking shape in a market, in an electricity market, especially in the uh, renewable integrated system. We have ancillary services to provide in inertia, which is called inertial response ancillary service. We have the fast storage devices to be connected in a system very fast. They are called as active power ramp service. We have frequency response similar to here. Okay. But uh, the frequency response and comparison with the frequency control with three uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary regulation will slightly be different for DRES market. Uh, voltage control services are almost similar, but the size of the or the volume of the requirement will change. So fault right capability and fault contribution uh, because of the distributed energy sources and power electronic interface, this fault right capability need to be de determined and how this will be mitigated very fast by the 
Pavel electronic interface will be one more ancillary service. Harmonic mitigation, as I told you, because nonlinear load are increasing day by day in a distribution system with power electronic interface, with nonlinear devices. Uh, mostly we have computers connected to a network today, and entire work is going with the ICT technology. So nonlinearity in a system is very, very high. So harmonic mitigation is also coming to be one of important ancillary services. So this difference must be very clear to you. So inertial response I'll talk of because I told you earlier that uh, the old genetics were very big in size. The rotor weight was quite high. So automatically there was the control of active power. Uh, whenever there is a change in the frequency due to the load generation balance, and this was taken care by the uh, inertia, inertia initially, and then the uh, sluggish acting uh, hydraulic uh, uh, your system connected to a generator to take care of the frequency. But today generators are smaller in size, like CHP based units, like uh, micro turbine based units. Okay, their sizes are small and inertia available is lower. So definitely there is a problem of inherent inertia in a system. Therefore, so how to take in the, the impact of this inertia change in a system uh, and how the inertial behavior is changing very fast in the future market that needs to be taken care. So we have to replace the synchronous generators by the uh, components where inertia is not very high. They are called non-inertial element, but virtual inertia is there. This virtual inertia needs to be computed and definitely we need to have the very fast acting devices connected in a system in terms of the micro hydrals or in terms of uh, your uh, CHB based systems or in terms of your energy storage elements. Okay, So this inertia uh, because of the wind generators, because of the CHB based plants, because of micro turbines, this inertia need to be computed uh, in, a, in a manner to have a faster inertial response for, for control of the frequency. So inertial response modeling, especially from the converter operated systems with a power electronic interface system is a, uh, is a challenging task and few research articles have recently appeared. You can go through those articles that how virtual inertia or synthetic inertia has been modeled uh, to provide you the frequency regulation service in a system. Okay, so uh, we have a earlier, we, 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 we have a 2000 megawatt, not 2000 uh, megawatt of wind, yeah, 2000 megawatt of wind turbines. This is, a, this, is a, this is a wind farm actually, but the size of the uh, wind turbine is uh, around 10 megawatt available. Uh, more than this also in the market, but most of the wind turbines are of smaller size, a few megawatts. So inertia constant uh, is a, of a wind farm is comparable. So uh, inertia, if you add up for the entire wind farm, that is comparable to the inertia of a synchronous generator, okay, 3.5 second. So this, this this has a good impact on the frequency regulation, but uh, in a microgrid or in a pico grid, inertial response need to be uh, determined for the power electronic converters. So virtual synchronous machine concept is coming up, as I told you, as a important uh, segment for the inertial behavior. So this is a simple example of solar photovoltaic system, which is not having an inertia, okay? So this is a solar photovoltaic system without the storage. This is a solar photovoltaic system with storage. If you compare both of them, if there is a frequency excursion, then uh, the photovoltaic power is uh, almost constant put into the grid. So this is the frequency change, which will take time to come to the original value until unless we add more solar power in the system. Okay, but it may take time uh, and the frequency may deviate, may deteriorate under this condition. Okay, but if we have a fast storage converters available connected to a system, then they can act very fast here. You see, whenever there is a change in frequency, rate of change of frequency is quite high here. So this rate of change of frequency lock off can be controlled by the fast storage element by putting the power, constant power into the system very fastly. Okay, so this is how they will control here. And whenever it's rising, which can have a more rising requirement. So this is also taken care by the storage device to, to absorb the power so that the frequency expression, the rate of change is controlled. So rate of change of frequency is very, very dangerous if it is very high. So we control this rate of change in a declining mode, in a, in a supplying mode by the storage device. So this storage device is helping uh, very much for the control of the frequency without any storage system connected to the solar photovoltaic system. So this is how the fast storage systems, they are taking care of the supply to the power and absorption of the power 
during the first rate of change of the frequency, making the uh, regulation of the frequency quite controllable. This is how in future you need to determine the virtual or synthetic energy of our uh, faster storage system in a solar PV based generation. So uh, practically, if you see, there is no market till which can which which is trading virtual energy, but markets are evolving. So many of you can work and think of working in this area. That what shall be the regulation? Uh, what shall be the market nature? Okay, how to procure the virtual inertia, how to develop the equations for the virtual inertia. Okay, and this inertia is in future is a uh, very important segment for control of the frequency and especially for the distribution side where we have the solar wind systems connected at a lower voltage with a lower inertia system. Frequency is excursion is uh, of great importance and I hope that uh, the inertial response market will exist in future, especially as an important ancillary service market. So synthetic energy concept is coming. So all of you can uh, can have more literature regarding the synthetic energy, especially with the DC link of DC DC converters or how to model it uh, in terms of the equation uh, relating your angular variation with the energy of a system and uh, how to find out the cost uh, as a regulatory element for the for the remuneration of the inertial response for the ancillary service providers. So we, we, we do require the fast frequency response uh, today. Okay, in, in, in addition to the inertial response, the fast frequency re response is essential. And this FFR refers to the ability of rapid change in the power output within a very small time frame, few hundreds to milliseconds. So we need a very fast storage devices which can put the power into the grid or into micro grid very fastly and having a very fast frequency response of milliseconds. So that is a concept coming up for ancillary service provision. So there is a there is a there is a probability of uh, more work in this area where we have the fast frequency response. And there is a difference. You, you can ask a question that sir, what is the difference between fast frequency response and primary frequency resolve? Response because their 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 basic nature is to bring the frequency to the normal range, but in a primary frequency response, if you see the previous uh, curves which I discussed with you, their uh, their 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 addition, their change in the frequency is not very 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 fast. Time requirement is different. Uh, okay, but here time requirement is in milliseconds. So in a millisecond, if you control the frequency by adding the power, this is better compared to the primary frequency response of a system, which is sluggish as compared to the fast frequency response. So as I told you that rate of change of the frequency, very uh, deviation is uh, very important. So we have to control this rate of change of uh, frequency with a fast acting devices. So that will be the future ancillary service market in terms of FFR response. So this is a one example, uh, which is generally called as a duck curve. Okay, we have a solar wind added in a system with lower inertia. So frequency the system is operating in this region. But if if, if the wind because of the wind velocity is not available, wind power is not available, or solar power because of the certain reason like cloud is coming and solar power immediately dip. So with the demand uh, will not be met immediately. There is a frequency excursion here. So this is compared to a duck curve. Okay, back side of the duck, the frequency is dipping quite large. And the slope is quite uh, large, okay, because of sudden change in the power output in a system due to the wind and solar. So this uh, this frequency has to be brought back immediately, very fastly. Otherwise, what will happen? That uh, your uh, frequency excursion may cause the instability in a microgrid or a grid, which will ultimately can a failure of a system. So we need to add the faster storage system here, so that this 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 minimum frequency is brought here to this area. So we need not to go to this duck, duck back, okay, because of this change. If there is a sudden dip in the power, immediately the devices need to be added, uh, taking the response here. So we can bring the frequency dip, uh, uh, you, you see this dip, which, which will not impact the system operation system behavior. So we need this kind of situation in the market. This is possible only when we have a fast storage reserves available with us, which are added very fast whenever there is a dip in the power because of the solar wind. Okay, so penetration level of the solar, which is dipping here very fast, 
we need to add the storage system so fast that the frequency excursion is this. So this is better. So we can have a, a very famous duct curve here. So we are demanding this situation in a lower industrial system. So active power rate control, active power ramp rate control is very important for these devices. And uh, the responsibility of the distribution network operator is that they need to have a fast reserve with, with them. And this is all fast energy storage systems. Yeah, this is because of the intermittency, there can be a situation. So we have a storage uh, system here. Solar wind, which may have a more dependent system, but with a storage network, which can be added into the network very fast. Okay, so fuel cell technology uh, is the future where absence is uh, about 85%. So all these storage system in terms of the fuel cell can be added to this network very fast. Okay, making this dip, this change in frequency like this. So you see from this change of frequency, we are coming to this change, which is better uh, for the operation of the system. Okay, with the addition of this flexible reserves. So flexible reserve market, we call it as a flexible reserve market. So flexible reserve market is the future. So what shall be the flexibility? How much will be the flexibility? What will be the requirement? What will be the cost criteria to pay them? Okay, how much fast they have to be? So this all reserve, fast reserve uh, computation uh, in an optimal manner need to be computed. So you can think of working in this area with the flexible reserves flexible reserve market and its remuneration process. This is one of the example taken. Okay, because of the flexible reserve, uh, there is an impact on the there is an impact on the prices. So you see the, there is an example given here for some electricity market are caught. Uh, I've taken it from the website, giving you an idea that uh, if there is a change in the uh, reserves available, and uh, how the price is changing because if there is reserve which can be fastly put to meet the deficit of the power the cost does not rise very high you see this cost the cost does not rise in this quarter and this quarter because of the first reserve available and there is a demand requirement and you're meeting demand very fastly so price is not changing so fast compared to this and this but if there is no reserve available fast reserve available and uh, we are not able to meet the demand what will happen that the cost is rising very high. So market inefficiency will be there because of this non-availability. So future is that uh, what, how much faster reserves are there to meet this demand very, very fast. So that the price of the electricity for that hour does not change much. And uh, the price of the electricity is not very high. But if uh, faster reserves are not there, then uh, the price may go high for a longer hours to meet the demand from the other reserves. Okay, and the cost component will go. So cost is related with the reserve available in a system as a very important ancillary service. This is smoothening of the power requirement. This is the time, okay? And this is the power per mega, uh, your uh, change of the power per mega what you are requiring. Uh, your P control uh, per unit per unit you are requiring for a system, okay? So you see, compared to this curve, if we have the faster reserve available added in a system, so uh, the smoothening of power is there. With faster reserve, the power smoothening means that requirement of the power is met in a very uh, reliable manner. But here, the curve, you see the slope of the curve is larger. So if we are adding very fast changes, changes of the power in a system, there can be a swing process or the uh, drastic change of the power in the system, which can hamper the operation of a system, uh, frequency of a system, but we have smoothening. We, we do require smoothening of the power compared to time. So with a faster reserve, the power smoothening causes better operation compared to the sudden change of the power in a system, though it is met with time. Okay, but uh, this curve, this, this, this smoothening with the storage devices is better. This is another example. Okay, you see how the power is changing. We, the power is dipping because of certain reason due to uh, from the wind or the solar available in the system. There is no storage system here. And uh, we are then uh, this is decrease in the power, dipping to this value, then there's a faster ramp, okay, which is causing a transient kind of situation in the system. This is the faster variation of the power, which is not desirable. 
or uh, there can be system excursions, but with storage system connected in a network, this is the storage behavior. This graph gives you storage behavior compared to the behavior of our change, which is exactly repli replicating this curve. But since storage devices cannot meet the entire change of the power, but definitely by, uh, by adding this fast storage system, this is smoothening the power variation, this green curve. So by having this storage system network, there is a smoothening of the power change. So this kind of operation is desirable. So this is a one of the important ancillary service component required in a system. So battery energy storage system is the future, especially in the distribution market. So we have a, a solar systems which are uh, having the boosting of the DC, uh, power from DC to DC converters. Then uh, DC to DC converter and DC to AC connected to a grid. In addition to this, we have the power uh, in both ways. They may store it and they may give it to the system. Okay, accordingly, uh, this is the power variation without the storage system, and this is how the power variation, which is within the limit. So the power variation, uh, we, we, is very large power, power variation is not required, which is a excursion giving you the change in frequency behavior very, very fast. Dangerous for a system, but with uh, the fast storage battery systems, battery energy storage system, the smoothening of the power which is obtained uh, from the PV or a wind array, okay, in a system integrated in a system, the power change behavior is uh, better, giving you frequency expression within the limit. So, this is the desirable feature as a one of the important ancillary service. So, best technology is coming to be future. Uh, LHT market as an important, important ancillary service market giving active power ramping uh, uh, in a system and uh, will be paid for the services to control the frequency behavior. So we, we have two kind of the modes here uh, in a under frequency or over, over frequency. So in under frequency or over frequency, this is a dead band where uh, we have a base frequency is normal here. Okay, the system is operating successfully with a same power, but whenever the frequency rises or the frequency decay very fast with a faster rate of change, we must have headroom available with us to absorb to, to absorb this frequency rise. Okay, so we call it as a FSM U mode. Okay, and uh, if there is a decrease in the frequency very fast, we must have this over frequency, uh, this uh, over frequency range that must be controlled very fast with the help of the uh, FSM U mode. So this is how the frequency behavior change, we need to have the power variation very fast in the system such that the power, the frequency is maintained within the, uh, within the tolerable range of the standards. Voltage is control and active power support, especially to the uh, distribution system. Uh, transmission system, I've already talked about. I have already talked with you about the transmission system, but in a distribution network, the voltage control and active power support services are uh, to be managed uh, in a more uh, clear manner. Why? Because that in a distribution network, voltage change, uh, voltage, drastic voltage change may cause the different operating behavior of system, especially whenever voltage is very, very low, your, your device is where the voltage requirement is proper, they will not function, like air condition, they will not work at a lower voltage. Okay. So at a lower voltage, the reactive requirement of uh, the current requirement will be very, very high, so losses in the network will increase. Therefore, the efficiency of the system will go down. This is one of the reasons that uh, distribution network do require a uh, better voltage control uh, with the reactive deployment of the services. And here we have three hierarchical structure as it is for the transmission network, primary voltage control, secondary voltage control, and uh, trusty voltage control for the system. So in a distribution network, the voltage control uh, has to be operated in a certain uh, Q range, okay? And it, it, for a few kilowatt of system, this is the Q range, okay? And for uh, 500 kilowatt or 5 or megawatt, this is the Q range to be given as per the standards. And for medium voltage range, we can have a, a synchronous generators connected in a system where the DGs and capacitor banks can provide the active support here. So for a different kind of directive requirement for a distribution network, for a voltage decay problem or voltage rise problem, for a, a lower voltage system, 
we have a strict voltage regulation services available, but this DG is providing as a voltage control very fast or a capacitor banks as a uh, secondary voltage control. OK, uh, continuously controlled capacitor banks. They need to be paid for the voltage control services. So payment mechanism is similar to the transmission system active support mechanism, but definitely the uh, cost characteristic curves, especially for DGs, need to be studied. So we have a cost characteristic curve for DG also. So we can uh, develop those equations for the DGs as a cost uh, characteristic criteria, and based on the cost characteristic uh, characteristic criteria, we can pay the ancillary services. Uh, providers. This is one of the example given to you that how the uh, wind DG connected in a network, especially uh, optimally connected. Okay, the voltage profile is this without the uh, uh, wind or solar, but with the wind or solar, this is the voltage profile. So this kind of voltage profile where the voltage is between one per unit point nine eight. This this voltage is very very good. You know, if you compare the voltage profile of this. Okay, without uh, solar or wind, but with solar and wind uh, availability, the uh, voltage profile is much better. So this kind of voltage profile will definitely be a better operating system uh, for a distribution network with lower losses. And uh, to make this voltage profile within 1 and 0.98 per unit, okay, we need to give the uh, cost component to the DGs as a directive support. Okay. So this cost characteristic need to be developed. So nodal pricing structure is the most transparent, so we can have a nodal pricing mechanism, which is a real time, uh, real time mechanism for the uh, operation of a system for uh, your pricing structure. So pricing for DG is very important. So there is a huge amount of work required for developing the entry supply market for DGs and a pricing mechanism. What, what shall be the financial tool for uh, for for giving the price to the directive support provided by the distributed generators. Fault right through capability and fault clearing capability is also coming out in one of the ancillary services in future, especially for the distribution network where distributed energy sources are connected and uh, this fault uh, right capability has to be determined, okay, especially for the wind turbines because of for their fast response times and. Uh, this, this, this fault has to be uh, recovered back, releasing energy to a system very, very fast. So fault riding, right through capability, fault clearing capability in a system need to be determined okay, very clearly for a distributed energy sources connected system. And this, be, this will be one of the ancillary services in future to have this fault right through capability of a system. This is one of the example that uh, different countries, they have uh, different standards for the fault right. And this uh, this must have be to be controlled in a certain time frame for better operation of a system. Okay, so you can uh, look at this uh, uh, fault right through capability uh, for with, with, for different countries with different methods, and what shall be the time of operation for controlling the disturbances and recovering the system back. This time is very very important. So we can uh, we we can have a look of this. As a very important data generation, as a very important information for the uh, different uh, uh, countries, and how the fault right capability will have a important role for operation of a system. So they have to be recovered in a very very small time for better operation of a system. But the DGs need to be uh, paid for that service. Harmonic mitigation definitely one of the example here is the harmonic mitigation. So if harmonics are quite large in a system, okay, so we, we, we have a sun capacitors connected at particular buses, uh, we, we, we can have a D stat form for a harmonic mitigation. So what will be the cost uh, criteria for paying the D stat com or capacitor banks or filters, okay, or defects devices to control the harmonics in a system? So harmonic mitigation is coming out to be one of the ancillary services. These are the standards like ITP standards, uh, especially in a distribution side. And these standards need to be modified. You can have a look on these standards, and uh, you can see that how much uh, within five percent as an ITP standard tolerable total harmonic distortion that need to be obeyed in a 
distribution system for defects for harmonic mitigation or uh, capacitor banks or filters for harmonic mitigation. These have to be paid in future. So financial complete compensation for DG. Financial compensation uh, for the capacitor banks or financial compensation for the filters, they need to be computed. So there is a huge scope of work in this area, especially to the harmonic mitigation side, because more harmonics they will have uh, a reactive current, a very high reactive current, and will give a more losses in a system. So the, how will you reduce these losses because of the harmonics? So the price can be computed in the form of the loss component. Okay. So if you if you save the energy, that saving energy because of the harmonics can be computed, and there can be a mechanism uh, which can be put as a solution for the remuneration process of capacitive banks as a filter. So this 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 is, this is all for uh, the ancillary services in the smart grid and microgrid domain. Okay. So this is this is how the change is there for the ancillary services, but these ancillary services definitely need to be computed in a well manner, especially in the in the term of reactive support, in the form of harmonic mitigation, in the form of inertial component, and uh, in the form of wild wild through capability. So the cost criteria need to be developed, uh, which is at initial stage. So you can think of working in this direction and uh, giving some of the thoughts inputs to the. Utility that how the ancillary service market will exist in future for uh, your microgrids. So this 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 all is I talked about. So integration of the EVs uh, probably yesterday's lecture you attended the EV connection how they are uh, changing the behavior of the network. So EV will play a very important role. Okay, so how the active active profile in the network will change because of the electrical vehicles, so they can have an impact in terms of peak shaving or reactive support in the system or compensating for the power quality in addition to the power requirement from the system. So electrical vehicles need to be uh, very well studied uh, as a nonlinear load because they can inject harmonic in the system. So how much harmonic will be injected by the electrical vehicles that need to be ascertained because this electrical vehicle load as a as a battery storage system inside will be totally nonlinear in nature. So that need to be ascertained uh, very, very carefully for you know, remuneration process for ancillary services if electrical vehicles are participating for as a demand response program. So vehicle to grid or grid to vehicle is a challenge in future. This is a integrated flow diagram for TSO DSO coordination as I as I told you that the distribution system operator is an important component today. And uh, the proper coordination of DSO in a smart grid area with the provision of the ancillary services, okay, that need to be uh, coordinated with TSO. So, how the DSO and TSO will coordinate to provide the ancillary services to a smart grid is an important challenge. So, this coordination uh, mechanism need to be developed. The optimal coordination mechanism need to be developed. Agent waste mechanism need to be developed. Okay, so taking into the two aspects of the ancillary services at the distribution side and transmission side, how they will be coordinate, coordinated together. There's a huge amount of scope of work here. So you can think of uh, the coordination process for the ancillary services in terms of directive power deployment uh, between the TSO and DSO. Of course, obstacles and barriers, uh, there are important points for the Technical barriers are there. Technical one of the technical barrier is the development of the uh, development of uh, the equipments, types of the DGs, okay, energy storage systems. How the technology uh, of a generation for specially to the storage systems will play a very important role. This is a technical barrier, but in future, uh, latest technology will help for the better dynamic capability of the new energy sources in terms of. Uh, grid operation. There are regulatory barriers because no regulatory policy are existing till uh, where you can have a clear cut policy decisions for uh, remuneration process or interconnection process for the ancillary services. So regulatory barriers are there. The government has to adopt them. The regulatory commission has to adopt them. So the suitable suggestions from the research side is uh, definitely required uh, to the regulatory bodies 
that in this fashion they have to be incorporated into the uh, rules and regulations for better operation of a system. So regulatory barrier is there, definitely because utility will not change its uh, operation very fastly. It will take time. Researcher will do do their work. The proposal will come from many researchers, but this proposal came to the final shape to be implemented in the market. That is a challenge. So regulatory body has to take care. The government has to come to the come with the conducive policies for uh, uh, the ancillary service provision in a system, especially in the smart grid area. Okay. Another is the coordination between DSO and uh, TSO. Uh, one of the important technical barrier uh, between the two important agents, uh, brains, independent system operator and uh, distribution system operator. How they will coordinate? How the data sharing will be there? How they will manage the data? How they will identify which devices are contributed? How much? So a technical solution to this problem is essential. Financial barrier is there, I, as I told you that uh, what will be the remuneration process? That is a barrier. Okay, this remuneration process needs to be very clearly designed. Hex devices uh, are coming out to be the defects devices as a memory controller, as a active support controller, okay, as a frequency regulation supporting the active support, okay. So maintaining voltage. So how the FETS devices will be remunerated? There can be the process. So these are the cost characteristics curve for FETS devices. As example to you, these can be modeled. These are well. Uh, Defined well available in the literature. So for a particular operator range, how much the is the investment cost? So this investment cost has to be recovered back. So how this will be recovered back? We can have a, a certain proposal. I have taken it as example to you that how it can be remunerated. So investment recovery. This is the uh, this is the uh, your production cost curve. This is the demand cost curve. They meet at certain point is the lambda price. Okay. So there is no congestion in a system here, but if system is congested, then the P will go here. The P limit will go here. If you draw this P limit, there will be two prices here. One price is this for load. This is for generation. So if you compare with previous one, where the price was one, the price has become two. For the load, the price is higher. For the generation, price is low. So both the producer and consumer are getting loss. So this cost, which is for uh, going in a market, is called congestion cost. So this congestion cost, we can take it from a market by adding certain devices. We can reduce it. So how to reduce it? Add a device here, three facts. So the P limit will rise to this point here. So there will be a difference of the congestion cost. So this was the congestion cost earlier without facts. This is the congestion cost now with the facts. What is the difference? This difference has happened because of the facts device. So this difference in the cost can be paid to a tax company. So this is a very important proposal which was appreciated in Elsevier. So such kind of proposal need to be developed in future that uh, how the cost component can be given to the uh, ancillary service providers. So defects will be a very important ancillary service component in the future. So how to remunerate is one of the processes suggested based on the social welfare. So how much cost work covering from a market and how much cost is reduced because of the fee uh, fax device. That cost difference can be paid by the system operator, DMO, distribution network operator to the service provider or a fax service providers. So this is a simple example which you can uh, go through. So with this, I end with my presentation. These are some of the important references I have taken for the preparation of this presentation and some of the research papers of our own students at NIT Guru Chetra. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for explaining uh, your uh, research in a wide uh, manner. OK, so thank you uh, for such an elaborative presentation in this uh, program. So now I would like to request any participants if you have any question. One and two questions can be taken. Uh, because we are running out of the time. Yes, any question from the participant?